there. Welcome. If you are watching this, it is because you are under 35, and our main story this week was about homeowners associations. So we thought we'd make a special substitute story just for you, as you will never be able to afford a house. <laughs> never. Absolutely never. It will not happen. So in lieu of you having a home that is also an investment, which, again, won't happen for you, we have made this segment that taps into something for which you and your age cohort may have deep, deep nostalgia, and it concerns this. How many times can you go to Chuck E. Cheese's before you've done everything there is to do? That's a very good question. You get a pizza count, feed the tunnel, jump in the ball pit. Shine it right over there. Chuck E. Cheese's, oh, no. where kids can be a kid. Yes. Chuck E. Cheese, with the seminal motto, where a kid can be a kid, as opposed to where a kid can see a dead body in the parking lot, which I believe is the slogan for Applebee's. And <laughs> it is not untrue. Also, if you are anything like me, you saw that ad and found yourself wondering, who the fuck is the old guy at the end there? I've got about a thousand questions about incoherent Gandalf here. He looks like he just escaped from Jumanji, and he sounds like he just free based tryptophan. It is... <laughs> It is hard to make out what he's saying there, but after my 50th viewing, I think I finally figured out what's going on. You see, they begin the ad by asking, how many times can you go to Chuck E. Cheese's before you've done everything that there is to do? And they end it with him pointing across the arcade as he says, I started right over here, <laughs> implying that he's been going to Chuck E. Cheese for a conservative 100 years. It's essentially... <laughs> The message of the ad is, come to Chuck E. Cheese, we guarantee you will die here. <laughs> now, if you were a child or a parent any time in the last four decades, you've undoubtedly been to a Chuck E. Cheese at least once. They're the original pizza and arcade restaurant made famous by their animatronic band, which played hits like this. We've got it together. Yes! Munch's make-believe band fucking shreds! <laughs> and, and I will introduce you to the whole band later on, but real quick, I simply love the fact that this purple monstrosity is named Munch. <laughs> I adore any creature named after a colloquialism for a certain sex act, and I've got to say, the name does fit. That is the face of a deep-sea explorer. You can just tell. <laughs> Purpalicious never stops diving. His treasure is your pleasure. He's a <laughs> reverse DJ Khaled, if you will. <laughs> but as an adult, you probably only hear about the restaurant whenever it gets bad press, like the fact that it was recently discovered that some Chuck E. Cheese's animatronics still run on floppy disks, or when the company felt forced to put out a statement swearing that it wasn't recycling pizza slices, <laughs> although when you're issuing a statement denying that, you have already lost the argument. <laughs> And perhaps the most notable way that Chuck E. Cheese can show up on the news these days is this. Some kiddie parties have turned into battlegrounds, and it's the adults that are behaving badly. We have several injured people here at Chuck E. Cheese. Yeah, we are on our way that, there. All right, there's a fight that broke out. We have people fighting, punching. I need a cop, I need an ambulance, I need everything. Yeah. Wow! A 911 call from a Chuck E. Cheese should not sound the same as one made after any Philadelphia sporting event. <laughs> But the fact is, adults do seem to love to fight at Chuck E. Cheese viciously and often. Just search Chuck E. Cheese Fight on Google and you will unlock hours of content, as well as find articles like this one from 2008 about how just one Chuck E. Cheese in Wisconsin had called police to break up 12 fights in just two years. In the biggest fight, seven officers arrived and found 40 people knocking over chairs and yelling in front of the restaurant's music stage where a robotic singing chicken and the chained namesake mouse performed. <laughs> With one local city official quoted as saying, what parent is going to take their kids to a place where there is alcohol and pistols being brandished? It was like something out of a Quentin Tarantino <laughs> film. And that sounds about right, doesn't it? Especially because if I had to take a guess, those fights, much like a Tarantino film, included a bunch of white people saying shit they really shouldn't be. <laughs> now, why does this happen so much? Why so much anger, darkness and viciousness rearing its head in the brightly coloured, well-lit funhouse where it's been promised that a kid can be a kid? And you might be thinking, well, John, it's stressful to manage a group of children and there is booze. That is why fights start. But no, no. I believe it's much deeper than that. 
I believe that there is a rot at the heart of Chuck E. Cheese. And while I don't have a definitive answer, I do have a tantalising theory. And I'll be honest, when we started writing something about Chuck E. Cheese for you, we were thinking, this will be five, six minutes tops. But the more we looked into it, the more fascinated we got. And this officially got out of hand. So, <laughs> I'm gonna be talking about Chuck E. Cheese for, and I'm not kidding about this, the next 25 minutes. <laughs> You can stop watching this at any time if you like, but this studio audience cannot leave. <laughs> and abandoning them feels like a pretty shitty thing for you to do. So, let's start at the very beginning. It was the spring of 1977. Woody Allen had the number one movie in the country. The son of Sam was terrorizing New York, and on May 17th, the first Chuck E. Cheese opened in San Jose, California. The restaurant arcade was the brainchild of Nolan Bushnell, co-founder of Atari. You know, the company made classic games like Space Race, Asteroids, Pong, Pong Doubles, Super Pong, Pin Pong, Hockey Pong, Super Pong 10, Ultra Pong, Ultra Pong Doubles, and Quadra Pong. Every single one of those is real, by the way. <laughs> Bushnell was looking for a way to make money off his game's usage in arcades and add entertainment to mealtime, something that he once described as fundamental to the human experience, because in discussing the invention of Chuck E. Cheese, he once said, and I quote, throughout history, there was a celebration, and the celebration had food, drink, and games without exception. Whether you were talking about the summer solstice with primitive man to the circuses in Rome, there was always an entertainment element. I always felt that was something that was lacking in restaurants. I wanted to add a dimension of fun to the act of having a meal. And this feels like a pretty good time to remind you that in the 1970s, literally everyone was on drugs. <laughs> also, if you're thinking the primitive summer solstice, circuses in Rome, those both sound very violent and sexual. Yes, exactly. We will get to that. Remember this moment, because it will be important later. <laughs> the point is, the Chuck E. Cheese was a response to the needs of the primal id of humanity. Check that superego at the door. As for the animal theme, Bushnell claims that his decision to include talking animals was inspired by his trip to Disneyland's Tiki Room, which in a way makes sense, doesn't it? Chuck E. Cheese is kind of like Mickey Mouse but a rat. <laughs> but interestingly, that's not initially what Bushnell was going for with the character. Originally, Bushnell planned to name the restaurant Coyote Pizza. So he ordered what he thought was a coyote costume for his lead animatronic. It turned out to be a rat. And Bushnell decided to run with it. First, he thought of changing the restaurant's name to Rick Rat's Pizza. But his team convinced him that having rat in a restaurant's name wasn't the best idea. So they agreed on calling the mascot Chuck. Chuck E. Cheese was originally almost more geared towards adults. He smoked a cigar, he had a Jersey accent. It was kind of like an adult night out. Like, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, you get it? That's true. That is true. The original Chuck E. Cheese was supposed to be a coyote, and once a rat was actually a bit of a saucy Jersey arsehole. In fact, here is one of the original animatronic shows from 1979. By now, it's probably no surprise to anybody that we got a birthday number coming up here. Well, it's a surprise to me. I didn't even get a present. Me neither, Big C. That's because it's not your birthday, Nitwit. Oh, oh yeah! yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, I gotta tell you, it's a tough way to make a living sitting and not being plugged into the same computer as that fruitcake dog. Anyway, anyway, listen, let's find out which table is having a birthday party. Yeah, Chuck E. Cheese was basically an insult comic. He was mean. He was dangerous. It felt like at any moment he was about to put his cigar out on a child's arm. <laughs> He was Joan Rivers meets Don Rickles meets every uncle on the Jersey Shore. Every birthday party probably started with the delivery of a pizza and ended with Chuck mercilessly destroying a five-year-old. <laughs> and the act was filled out by other characters, like the aforementioned Mr. Munch, a perma-hungry husky alien from Planet Purple, who Bushnell said was kind of our cookie monster. <laughs> then there was Jasper T. Jowls, the southern cowboy dog, who, when first introduced, was flanked by Confederate flags, <laughs> and who Bushnell later described by saying the hound dog was stupid as shit. <laughs> then there was Dolly Dimples, a seductive hippo torch singer that would flirt with patrons for a quarter. <laughs> As the first president of the company, Jean Landrum, later said, every time she hit a high note, her boobs went up and down. <laughs> her boobs went up and down when she hit her high note, and then the kids were enamoured with this, and I said, oh, my God, what have I done here? 
And I can actually answer that for you, because it's very simple. You turned one of the world's deadliest animals into a headline performer at your casino and titty bar for children. That's what you did. <laughs> also, do you have any idea how astronomically horny you have to be to build mechanical dancing breasts for an animatronic hippo? It takes an otherworldly horniness to even pitch something like that in a business meeting. Probably multiple meetings, by the way, because I know it was a different era. But surely that wasn't an immediate yes from everyone around the table. <laughs> At some point, you had to say, you know what, I want to circle back to my previous point about the hippo breasts, if that's OK. <laughs> and once it was OK, you had to relay that level of horniness to a team of engineers, other human beings. You gave them notes like, I think we can get more movement here, don't you? <laughs> it's fucking madness, and I love it! <laughs> so, look. It's clear from the start that Chuck E. Cheese was pulling from a lot of inspirations, Disney, Sesame Street and porn. And they <laughs> augmented all of this with a costumed character of Charles Entertainment Cheese who would walk around the restaurant. And as we now know, this concept was a smash hit. People absolutely loved the shit-talking rat and his boundary-pushing antics. By 1980, they'd added dozens of stores, even a few internationally, and began franchising. The problem was, pretty soon, their success attracted imitators. There was uh, Captain Andy's Rivertown Restaurant, uh, there was Tex Critter's Pizza Jamboree, Major Magic's All-Star Pizza Review, Gadget's Gigglebees, and one called Pizza Planet, which had a truly horrifying mascot. Now you can celebrate your birthday with Peppy Roni and Sylvester Stallion at the Pizza Planet. No, 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 no! No, no, no! I hate that so much! I hate everything about Dollar Store Kung Fu Panda here! I swore to myself I would go to my grave never knowing what it would look like if a panda bear fucked Michael Myers. And that promise <laughs> has now been fundamentally broken. <laughs> but Chuck E. Cheese's big rival was a chain called Showbiz Pizza Place. And at this point in the story, we are meeting our antagonist. And as in so many great myths, the antagonist actually started out as an ally. Chuck E. Cheese's success caught the attention of businessman Robert Brock, and he signed on to franchise more than 200 locations. But that same year, Brock ended up canceling the deal, finding an engineer for animatronics and launching a family restaurant chain of his own. He called it Showbiz Pizza. The concept was pretty much the same. It was different characters, but the same kind of like pizza, arcade games. There was definitely a rivalry between the two at the time. And Showbiz had arguably better animatronics. Chuck and his friends were limited to frames on the wall. Showbiz had an entire band called Rockafire Explosion, made of full body characters. Now, that is a pretty clear advantage, isn't it? The Chuck E. Cheese characters were trapped on the wall like dead eyed furry Hogwarts portraits. So, <laughs> if you wanted your children to have three dimensional, fully articulated nightmares, Showbiz was really the only place for you to go. The Rockefeller explosion was the result of a collaboration between Robert Brock and engineer Aaron Fector. They basically took Nolan Bushnell's idea for an animatronic band and they near perfected it. And they made other adjustments to get an edge over Chuck E. Cheese too, including a room where moms could go to watch soap operas while the kids play. <laughs> Likely a big step up from the treatment that moms got at Chuck E. Cheese, which I'm pretty sure involved Chuck calling them toots and whistling as they bent over the ski ball machine. Come on, it's my birthday! <laughs> Showbiz Pizza was a big hit. And unfortunately, things got bad for our cranky rat. Chuck E. Cheese sued Showbiz Pizza, resulting in a two-year legal battle that they eventually won. But then came the video game industry crash of 1983, and arcades were hit hard. Chuck E. Cheese saw its revenue plummet to the point where they lost $15 million just that year. And like the dumbest person in your family playing Monopoly, Chuck E. Cheese declared bankruptcy. <laughs> Showbiz Pizza, however, was somehow able to weather the storm, and in a cataclysmic move that would forever change the world as we know it, Showbiz snaps up its competitor. That's right, Showbiz Pizza snatched the rat. The copycat bought the original. I will hold for gasps now. <laughs> in 1985, the Showbiz and Chuck E. Cheese merger was completed, but here is an unexpected twist, because it soon turns out the new company could no longer use the Rockefeller explosion because Aaron Fector, their creator, had parted ways with the company but still owned the rights and declined to hand them over to the newly merged company, essentially killing his own creation's music career. With the Rockefeller characters now off the table, the new chain made the best of a bad situation and started to retrofit the animatronics to convert them 
to Chuck E. Cheese characters, even putting out this horrifying video for franchises to understand exactly how to strip the robots down. Now, quick side note here. There are still massive rocket fire explosion fans out there who've collected and carefully restored the old original animatronics. A while back, one fan even went viral by programming his private collection to sing current radio hits like, and this is real, Usher's Love in This Club. <laughs> Nothing to say about that other than how great it is. They should play the next inauguration, whoever it is for. And look, I would be remiss if I didn't show you how they handled that song's rap break, because however you think they did it, it's better. What you want, what you want, what you need, what you need, got to trap, got to trap, set you free, sexually, mentally, physically, emotionally. I'll be like your medicine. You'll take every dose of me, it's going up. It's fucking perfect. There are not many songs dirtier than Love in This Club, and it's frankly astonishing that the perfect presentation of it is through these wildly wholesome animatronic characters. And at this point, I actually have a quick side note to the side note that we are already on, because <laughs> the resurgence in interest in the Rock of Horror explosion about a decade ago resulted in the band being recruited to perform with CeeLo Green in the midst of his legal troubles <laughs> live in Las Vegas in 2013. We do have a clip from the performance, and one part in particular doesn't hold up great. <laughs> I mean, I mean, come on. Mr. Policeman, I gave you all the clues. <laughs> now, now back to Chuck E. Cheese. The new animatronics expanded the range of what the band could do, including the addition of a redesigned Helen Henny, the chicken songstress who added a lot of class to the act. Helen, how did you get started in show business? Well, there's a flock of performers in my family. My folks work in vaudeville doing a trampoline act. Dare I ask? Well, you mean you never heard of the spring chicken? <laughs> oh, no. Oh, my lord. Come on, babe. Why don't we paint the town? Walk, 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 and all that jazz. Come on. That there is a star. Just look at Mother Darling. Face beat, body snatched, hair tea so much it's in therapy as we speak. That is a mother clucking lip sync assassin right there. And then on the drums, there was Pasquale, who I can only describe as illegally Italian. Hit it, Pasquale! Pasquale, the chef here, and I'm keeping time. I provide the rhythm while we sing the rhyme. I'll be the first to tell you that I'm quite a ham. Everyone can see the great comedian I am! <laughs> I, I do hope that I'm not perpetuating the same thing that I'm condemning when I say, Now that's a spicy hate to crime! <laughs> By the mid-1990s, Chuck E and the gang were in their absolute prime, producing full-fledged music videos, educational content and sketch shows to be played in stores. In 1999, they even made a feature-length film titled Chuck E. Cheese in the Galaxy 5000. The basic plot is this. A child named Charlie Rocket needs $50,000 to fix his aunt and uncle's tractor, and the only people who can help are Chuck and the gang. Now, why is the maintenance of vital farm equipment a child's responsibility? It is never made clear, but <laughs> the mascots sign up for an intergalactic race. The Galaxy 5000 to win the prize money. It is an absolutely wild hour of film history, but here is just a taste of the tone. I'm Chucky, and this is my navigator, Jasper. Hiya, I'm Astrid. I think racers are so fascinating. So, you'll meet me at the soda shop after the race tomorrow? <laughs> you bet! <laughs> See ya. <laughs> Wait, Chucky, you slime dog? Yep. Yep. They're all sexually attracted to human women. That is canon. 
And you'd think they'd keep it in their pants while a literal child is with them, but no. They are honking if they are horny. They are engaging in... Yep. What's the term, CeeLo? Sexual harassment! That's it, that's it. I knew you'd know. <laughs> Needless to say, at this point, Chuck E. Cheese was on top of the world, but the good times never stay good, do they, friends? By the 2010s, sales were down and their cultural cachet was drying up. So in 2012, the company went looking for a new direction to breathe some life into the brand. And the one that they took was absolutely outrageous. No longer was Chuck E the wisecracking rat of the 70s and 80s, or indeed the catcalling smooth talker of the 90s and 2000s. Now he was, according to the company, not a rat at all. He was a mouse with a never-before-heard backstory that they published into a full book. The new origin story goes that Chuck E. Cheese grew up in an orphanage named, wait for it, St. Marinara's, and, <laughs> quote, because Chuck E. was an orphan, no one knew when his birthday was, so he never had a birthday party of his own. This made Chuck E. sad. So, after winning $50 in a Pong tournament, good cross-branding, by the way, <laughs> he runs away to New York City, where he sleeps above the kitchen in a pizzeria. He's then discovered by a friendly Italian chef named Pasquale, who hears Chuck E. sing and declares, a mouse that can sing? My restaurant is saved. Am I gonna make you a star? <laughs> All this is to say... Chuck E. Cheese was now a far cry away from the cigar-smoking, shit-talking rat that started it all. Then, in 2017, in a devastating blow, the company made this terrible decision. Yeah. Chuck E. Cheese restaurants are disbanding the classic animatronic band. The restaurant simply says the taste of people have changed over 40 years, <laughs> so the kids these days, they're not really interested in the robot troupe. Oh, really? They're not interested in the robots, are they? Well, if that is true, then fuck kids these days! <laughs> I don't typically hop into the Generation Wars because I've got a Gen X birth certificate and a boomer body, but if Gen Z or whatever the fuck comes next with the cause of all this, they can burn in the fires of eternal hell. But sadly, it is true. The animatronics started getting phased out, which is already brutal enough, but apparently when a store gets rid of them or closes, a company policy requires them to destroy Chuck E. Cheese's head and other branded items, something that a local newspaper reporter once captured on video. It's moving day for Chuck E. Cheese. This is Lorraine Swanson, our blonde head. And we're smashing up the Chuck E. head. It's rather symbolic. I mean, I guess, I guess it's symbolic. They're smashing a Chuck E. Cheese head while a Chuck E. Cheese store goes out of business. It's not exactly subtext, is it? To the extent that there is symbolism there, it's from the Darren Aronofsky school of subtlety and hints. The point is, <laughs> the company hit a major speed bump in the mid-2010s, and the pandemic just made things worse. And in a sign of just how desperate they were to stay afloat, the company wound up doing this. All right, listen to this. A Reddit customer, a uh, Reddit user, I should say, in Philadelphia, thought that she was supporting a local pizza business when she ordered from Pascali's Pizza. But when her food arrived, it looked familiar. She texted Grubhub, uh, the driver, to say, hey, just curious, was this food from Chuck E. Cheese? Turns out the chain is operating a restaurant under a different name, Pascali's Pizza and Wings. What the fuck, Chuck E. Cheese? <laughs> you can't just change your name and pretend to be something else. That's for rapper artists looking to mix it up and companies that did one too many genocides. Look, <laughs> look, I know I've been talking about Chuck E. Cheese for longer than anyone thought was humanly possible, but this actually brings me to my point here. Chuck E. Cheese has completely lost the plot. Remember when I said I was working up to a theory? This is that moment right now. My theory is Chuck E. Cheese was a brand founded on darkness. There was an inherent meanness, a viciousness, a danger embedded in the company from the jump. It was modelled on solstice celebrations and Roman circuses. Its tone was left of centre and in a fucking ditch. Chuck E. Cheese was an asshole. <laughs> Kids could scent that. They craved it. They liked being negged. And the parents appreciated kids' entertainment with some edge to it. Moms were horny for the taboo, attracted to the danger. And dads loved to watch the heaving bosom of an oversexed animatronic hippo. Hell, even Nolan Bushnell himself once spoke about Chuck E. Cheese at a professional tech talk like this. You can't imagine the weird things that people do from inside of a Chuck E. Cheese costume. <laughs> 
The other thing that you don't know is the weird things that employees do in the Chuck E. Cheese changing room closet. Locked door, small space, anyway. Um, Think about that. I'm pretty sure the founder of Chuck E. Cheese just admitted that people fuck in the costume closet and jerk it in the mascot suit. That is the guy responsible for your childhood memories. I bet when I made that joke earlier about Mr. Munch being named explicitly after Cunnilingus, you thought that I was reaching a bit. You're not so sure about that now, are you? <laughs> but the point here is... Nolan Bushnell was a weirdo who made a boundary-pushing pizza saloon that people went cuckoo over, and with every sanitised rebrand, with every attempt at making Chuck E. Cheese the target of sympathy instead of disgust, the more the customers absorb the rage that once belonged solely to Chuck, and now the balance is all out of whack. When Chuck E. Cheese was off-kilter, you as a customer were free to relax. But now that the rat is a brain-dead singing birthday orphan with no discernible personality, who clearly doesn't fuck intergalactic NASCAR pit chicks no more, <laughs> the universe is just off its axis. So, where is this all leading up to? Honestly, I'm not entirely sure. I stopped intellectually absorbing anything that I've said about 15 minutes ago, but the prompter <laughs> is telling me to say this. Chuck E. Cheese, you have lost your way. And we want to help you help yourselves. You know, recently, we discovered that another beloved rodent is set to enter the public domain in the US at the end of this year. The original steamboat Willie Mickey Mouse will soon be a free agent, and I would heavily recommend that you consider adopting him. He is the perfect fit. He's a famous rodent who loves to entertain, and he won't be afraid to push boundaries, because once he enters the public domain, you can easily turn a sweet, lovable mouse into a shit-talking one. I'll show you just how it could work. Please, come out here, Mickey. Please, come say hi. Come say hi to everyone. Hey there, Mickey. Hey. How you doing? Hey. Oh, Shelly! <laughs> wow. Where's, where's Shelly? You, uh, you really won't let that go, will you, Mickey? No! They haven't found it yet, have they? Well, no, no, they haven't. That's a solid point, Mickey. In order to restore balance to the Chuck E. Cheese universe, we promise that he will hit you with that classic hostile crowd work that this brand was frankly built on top of. How would you say happy birthday to the kids, Mickey? <laughs> You're not special. Nothing about you is special. <laughs> I love it, Mickey. That is just cold-blooded. And instead of singing happy birthday to your kids when he brings out the pizza, he'll say this. As a citizen of the United States, you are part of the most violent, genocidal, imperialistic empire the world has ever known. Your silence is complicity. Good <laughs> Lord, Mickey. And if you're wondering if this one will jerk it from inside the costume, to that we say... Oh, I'm doing it right now. <laughs> and we wouldn't have it any other way. So the offer is on the table. Chuck E. Cheese, this disguster mouse could soon be yours. That is our show. Thank you so much for watching. Good night. There he is. No. Hey, hey, Mickey. Don't move. Don't move over me. This is sexual harassment.